the doctrine on the end times. Now, what do I mean by end times? About the second coming of Jesus. That doctrine in the Orthodox Church is very un undeveloped. What does that mean, undeveloped? We don't have much theology about the second coming of Christ in the Orthodox Church. Our theology, our eschatological theology, excuse the $64 word, eschatologia, that's a Greek meaning dealing with the end times, is very simple, and it's in the Nicene Creed, and it goes this way, and he shall come again to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end, period. That's the end of the theology on the last days. Nothing of final authority, that's what I'm trying to say, nothing dogmatic, nothing binding on the penalty of excommunication like the Emousios de Patri of the first, second person of the Holy Trinity. There's no ecumenical council that has defined the truth concerning the end times. You hear me tonight. Therefore, there is some room for theologizing, if I can use the word speculating. Theologumina, have you ever heard of that term? Theologumina means a theological opinion, a pious opinion, uh, nothing uh, defined, nothing, nothing final. But how many of you believe that it's important to know about the second coming of Jesus Christ? How many of you believe that we should not live with ambiguity and uncertainty and vagueness about the second coming of Christ? Do you agree with me on that? And yet, the fact of the matter is that our Orthodox people live with much ignorance. Forget about the ambiguity. It's not even ambiguity. It's just plain good old ignorance. They don't even know anything about the second coming of Christ. Why? Because we don't hear about the second coming of Christ. Few, if any, priests bring it up. And when I bring it up in some churches, I get uh, warnings from the pastor that here we don't talk about those things because we don't want to scare the people. In fact, in one church where I preached the second coming, some congregate, people in the congregation w stood up and walked out. They were, well, to put it simply, they were scared. So, but like the bumper sticker says, we got to, sometimes you got to be scared out of, how does it go? Scared, scared out of hell or? Read the Bible. And it'll scare the hell out of you. There it is. And I think what we need to do is scare the hell out of a lot of our Orthodox people because they're pampered, pampered, milk-fed, and just fall rotten by our mesmerizing sermons in the Greek Orthodox Church. They put them to sleep. We tickle the ears of people in our churches. We don't warn them of the impending judgment that's coming. Repent, Jesus said, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist said it. Jesus said it, and then he said to his disciples, you say the same thing. He gave, us, he gave them the sermon topic. And I used to sweat it out every Saturday night for years as a priest. What am I going to tell them tomorrow morning? I want to sound original. I don't want to sound ignorant to the people. I got impressed with some, something new. But it's the same, same topic. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So once again, there's very little theology. When I went to seminary, uh, we covered the grounds in one lecture, the whole thing about the second coming of Christ. There wasn't much to talk about. Amen? Jesus is going to come again, and he's going to divide, separate the sheep from the goats, period. There's a hell in the heaven, and if you behave, you're going to heaven, if you don't behave, you're going to go to hell, period. Tilio said, that's the end of story. Nothing more, nothing less to say. But what I want to talk about today is something over and beyond that simple eschatology, that Sunday school level, that elementary level of eschatology. 
And I want to turn with you to 1 Thessalonians 4.13. I, I don't know if I'm going to have time to cover everything tonight. I've got, oh, I've got so much, um, I've got so much to talk about. I got, let me see, um, uh, 4.13. Yes, 4.13. First Thessalonians. I, I, and I'm, and I'm warning you from now. Whatever I'm going to say tonight is will be very sketchy, uh, barely exhausted, hardly exhausted at all. I cannot exhaust the subject. It's inexhaustible tonight, but it's very fascinating, very exciting to know what we're going to do when Jesus comes back again, where we're heading for, what kind of an age it will be in which we will be living. No one ever told me about how exciting it's going to be when I die and what, what I can look forward to. All I could think about is what? The fright, the fearfulness about death. I was scared to death of death because I didn't know what was going to follow after. Jesus meant nothing to me after death except he was some judge with a big club ready to knock me over the head as soon as, he, as I go up there to meet my judge. So, there's something exciting about the age which is to come beyond the grave. And uh, let me just uh, go roughly over this scripture. It's familiar to you. In fact, uh, this is the apostolos that we read at every funeral service. Do you hear me? How many of you have been to a funeral service? the Greek church. I used to hear this apostolos when I used to perform funerals, and yet I never knew what he was talking about. I never in all my life heard any priest or bishop ever explain the apostolos of the funeral. Now you, you, you explain that to me. And this scripture is about the rapture. And yet I never knew what that word meant until just a few years ago. And I had three theological degrees after my name. Here, the Apostle Paul is comforting the survivors who have lost loved ones. And he's saying, be comforted. Now, I'm just, I'm just paraphrasing here because to save time. I can't read uh, all the scripture. Uh, but he's saying, for this we say unto you, verse 15, by the word of the Lord, so what he's saying is authoritative. It's not his private opinion. He says, by the word of the Lord, where did he get the word of the Lord? Did Paul ever meet Jesus? Well, of course he met him on the way to Damascus. But he was not discipled by Jesus. But he received the revelation from the Lord. By the word of the Lord, what? That we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not go before them which are asleep. In other words, when Jesus comes back again, we will not rise until the dead rise first. They will come up from the graves. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. How is Jesus coming? Is he coming quietly? It, it, uh, 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 without anyone taking notice? Some people teach that, that uh, people will be raptured and uh, no one will know about it. Hush, it'll be silent. And people will be looking around where everybody is, you know. People will be vanishing. But no, they'll know it. Jesus coming with a shout. Uh, I wonder what it's going to sound like, Jesus shouting. I don't know whether he shouted while he was uh, on earth during his earthly ministry. But he's coming with a shout. And what else, with, what else is accompanying his return? The voice of the archangel. Now, the, the, so Jesus is going to shout. What is he going to shout? I don't know. He didn't, we're not told. But to use a little imagination, he might say, rise, like he said to the dead when he raised them from the dead. Awake, rise. Well, he might say, rise now. It's time. It's morning. Good morning. Get up now. Uh, and also, uh, with the voice of the archangel. Now, what's the archangel going to say? Well, we're not told. We must lay. These are pure calculus. So, we need only imagination. Just trust the Lord. 
that uh, he's going to wake us up, that's for sure. And with the trumpet of God, trumpet, okay? How do we say that in Greek, trumpet? Salpinga. Salpinga theu. Maybe we need a few trumpets in church to kind of remind us. Get our ears tuned to the sound of the trumpet so that when we do hear it, we won't say, what's that? I've never heard that instrument before. <laughs> Who's making all that noise with that thing? Uh, the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Who's getting up first from the grave? It's the family, the one that departed souls. Shall rise first. Well, wait a minute. I thought the dead were someplace in heaven, the souls. How come they're going to come from the grave? Where are they? Are they in the grave or are they up there in heaven? So if they're up in heaven, then how are they going to rise? Well, I think God, the Lord is going to join the souls with their Amen. resurrection bodies. Amen. So they're going to meet somehow in a miraculous way. That's what it is. And then we who are alive, the rest of us who are still around, I don't know whether we'll be around. Maybe we will. Maybe we may, may, may not. I don't know, we're not sure, uh, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. And that's where the word rapture comes from. Shall be caught up. The catching up is the rapture. And in Greek, the, wor the verb is arpa yisometha, from the word arpa, arpa hume. If I think, if I know my, my New Testament Greek, I think that's the verb. Arpahi. And you know, uh, it's a very easy word because we use that word in modern Greek today. You know, to arpaxis we say, Tito nekin to arpaxis eti. Arpaxi to psoni ketaripa. You know, we use it in vernacular Greek today. You know? Yeah. So I mean, uh, the rapture should be simple for uh, us Greeks. It's because it's our word, our verb here, our pahi, and yet the, the, the term is totally unknown in orthodox eschatology. Shall be called up together with, the cloud, with them in the clouds. Where are we going to meet Jesus? I, I, I know it. In heaven? No. In between heaven and earth someplace in the clouds. We're going to meet him. To meet the Lord in the air. The Naora. That's what it says in the Greek, original, Yaira. And so we ever be with the Lord. Very simple eschatology, no detail. Oh, you're Jesus. Apostle Paul, why don't you give us a little more detail? I, I, I'm so curious. What does it mean to be with the Lord? Shall be with him. We shall ever be with the Lord. Pandote to It says there in the original Greek. Asometha means shall be with the Lord. Pandote mazime tongirium. Pandote. From that moment on, <coughs> we shall be with the Lord always. How long? For, for a few decades? For a few centuries? No, forever. For thousands and thousands and thousands of years we will live with the Lord. Are you afraid of death tonight? What are you afraid of? What are you going to give up? A few decades. You're worried that you might not be around for a while. You know what's waiting for us thousands and thousands of years of, of a beautiful existence. You know how small-minded we are as Christians? And I say that to myself, you know, we're, we're all scared about death. You know, we don't want to die, you know, like it's the end of, of existence, you know, like it's the greatest disaster. And yet it's not. It's a blessedness. The Word of God said, Blessed are they who die in the Lord. Lord. Makari and Kirio, most of the things I forgot the original Greek there. Hallelujah, glory to God. Okay, we shall be caught up. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. There's our comfort that we shall be with Jesus always. Didn't Jesus say, I shall be with you always, even unto the end of the age? And that means even beyond death had death. Death, death has nothing to do with our relationship with Christ. It doesn't affect it one iota. Our relationship continues. Like St. Simeon the theologian said, that, well, he didn't, you remember what he said? St. Simeon said, I'm not waiting for the return of Jesus. 
Why? He never left to return. For say, it seemed to me he was so real that Jesus already was, was bad. Uh, Jim, think of the union St. Simeon had with the Lord Jesus Christ. He was not even excited about the return of Jesus. Jesus was so well known to him, so intimate, so close with him, he lived and he breathed Jesus Christ, that he thought it was ridiculous to think about his return. He never left to return. That's a challenge for you and for me, for our relationship with Jesus Christ. Does Jesus... Does he mean that much to you and me? Does he tonight? Think about it. I doubt it very much. Now, you might say, well, if this is all so strange and new and familiar, then is it right to say it's orthodox? Since it's not in our orthodox doctrinal books, in our manuals. It's not that, well, you know what I got news for you? I was reading one of the church fathers by the name of Irenaeus. How many of you have heard of Irenaeus? But it's Ecclesiastes. And you know what he says in his chapter 5 against heresies? This excited me. He says, Therefore, when in the end the church shall suddenly be caught up. Whew! What are you, a Pentecostal? What are you talking about? Are you a fundamentalist? Shall be caught up from this. You know what he was referring to? To the Great Tribulation. So the church will be raptured from this uh, Great Tribulation. It is said there shall be tribulation such as has not been since the beginning, neither shall be. He's what is he doing? Quoting the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's saying the church will suddenly be caught up from this, from the great tribulation. So he's a pre-trib, uh, you know, thinker. Jim, pre-trib. I might have another opinion about that. I might be mid-trib. But it's interesting that a great church father who lived in the 200s that's very close to, to Christ. And he came from the Church of Asia Minor. He was a bishop of Leon, but he came from the school of Asia Minor where John the theologian, the revelator, that was his school, and he was schooled by, by John and his disciples. He wasn't an immediate disciple of, uh, of John, but uh, through other disciples, he was disciple, disciple of St. John. So all the writers, church writers, especially of Asia Minor and of the school of Antioch, the Antiochian school, they uh, emphasized the rapture and the millennium. I'm going to come to this now. <coughs> In fact, as I was doing some research, I found another church father who taught the rapture. Uh, who says this is an orthodox? If they're going to burn me to the stake, they might as well burn St. Irenaeus to the stake, too. And here's another saint. How many of you ever heard of St. Ephraim the Syrian? Yeah. Ephraim of Syros? Great uh, Syriac father? In his book, a writing book of a cave of treasures, uh, he, lived, uh, he wrote this in uh, 393 A.D., he says, for all the saints and elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation that is to come and are taken to the Lord, lest they see the confusion that is to overwhelm the world because of our sin. Now that's pre-trib to me. That sounds like pre-trib. Be taken to the Lord, lest they see the confusion that is to overwhelm the world because of our sins. In other words, uh, the tribulation will take place when? After the rapture. In other words, once the Lord gathers up, all right, he picks out from the world his own, his elect, amen, the true Christian or true believers, and then uh, the Antichrist will appear according 
to Paul's teaching in Second, uh, Second uh, Thessalonians. Then the Antichrist will make his appearance uh, in the beginning of the seven-year tribulation period. Seven years. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the Antichrist will do his work of evil. I don't, know, I don't have time to get into the details of this. But uh, St. Ephraim has a lot to say about eschatology, and he believed that the 70th final week of Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks will finally be fulfilled during the final seven years of this age when the Antichrist will appear. He even accepts the gap theory that we think is fundamentalist or the parenthesis between Daniel's second 69th week and the 70th week of years, taught also by the early church writers Barnabas, one of the apostolic fathers, and Hippolytus. So the Lord will descend in the air, number one. Number two, the saints will be raptured in the air to meet him. Number three, uh, here Christ will stop in the air and will be visible to all. For as yet he will not descend on earth because he is not fit to receive. The earth is not fit to receive him. Number five, he will take up the saints with him into the third heaven till the general conflagration and the burning of the world is over. And six, and to preserve them from it. And then shall all the elect of God descend from heaven to earth with Christ and reign with him for a thousand years. So uh, Jesus will come back again after the seven years tribulation with all his saints, metatonayunaftu is the expression in, in the Bible, in the Greek. And, you know, I always, always, always used to think that that meant the angels will come with him, only the angels. But now I see that, like it says in Jude, it's not the angels only, but Jesus will come back, metatonayun, with his saints, the righteous, righteous ones, the righteous ones that he had raptured begin, before the great tribulation. Follow me now. Follow me. And what will take place after the rapture? During those seven years of tribulation on earth, when there will be calamities on earth, and the Antichrist will reign as a world dictator and uh, manifest uh, Satan's end time plan and persecute the Christians and put them to death, uh, what will happen in, in heaven, in the third heaven, with those that he raptured? Well, the wedding supper of the Lamb will take place, in my understanding, as the way I understand it. We're going to be celebrating the wedding supper of the Lamb. For it says that, uh, that the wedding supper is being prepared, uh, and uh, the body of the bride of Christ, uh, we are the body of Christ as believers. We are to consummate our union with Christ, with the bridegroom. The bride and the bridegroom are finally going to be wedded, married together. We are the bride of Christ. Amen. He is the bridegroom. And we are now betrothed. It's like an engagement period. We're, we're, we're courting. We're, it's, a, it's a courtship right now. More than a courtship, we've already what? We promised uh, each uh, one to another. We betrothed. Uh, we have our betrothal ring, uh, and uh, it, it, we've said, "Lord, we're not going to look at, at any other person and any other groom. You are our, our, my groom, and I will not look at anybody else." Okay, that's the way. When you were engaged, you know, you know what you told your. Your, your, your fiancé, that you're the only one for me, I'm not going to look at another woman, or I'm not going to look at another man, you belong to me, I belong to you. And you, got, you were prepared for the wedding day. You remember all the, the excitement about the wedding day. And, uh, uh, it, but but what, what was the most important thing during your, your uh, courtship? was the wedding day. Not even the wedding party was, was important, but what was, what was the ultimate was the consummation of the wedding, of the marriage union, the nuptial union, the physical union. That, that's the consummation. And it, it, all the, the aspirations end there. 
Amen. That's the, that's the way it is with Christ and his bride. We will be united together with him. Now, as far as when the rapture will take place before the, the great tribulation or after or in the middle, there are various schools of thought, and I don't want to sound dogmatic. I will not be dogmatic about it. But as the Lord gives me the illumination, and he's still shedding light on the teachings of the end time. Do you, know, you realize that? Jesus said the Holy Spirit will come and shall show you what it will take place in the future, he said. Okay, so we don't know everything right now. I don't claim I know all the details, but I feel right now, at the fifth time, that it's very likely the Lord will come back to rapture his saints in the middle of the tribulation. He will allow his people to suffer martyrdom the first half, three and a half years, uh, to test them out where they would accept the mark of the beast and accept uh, the uh, rulership and the control of this world dictator and uh, to accept him rather than to uh, accept uh, martyrdom. Because the book of the Revelation says that anyone that refuses the mark of the beast uh, on his hand or on his forehead will be executed. In fact, we are told what the method of execution is. How will it be beheading? Beheading. Uh, it probably will be done, you know, the animated process, you know, with animation, bang, 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 the heads will just be rolling. You know, it's not going to be like in the old French days, the time of the French Revolution, in Anakifali once a day, but uh, there'll be heads rolling, many of them. So I believe that the Lord will take his people out in the middle. you know why? Because the second half of the Great Tribulation will be the time of natural disasters. When the vials will be poured out. When the plagues will be visited upon the earth. When um, a natural calamities will take place. Unprecedented. And I don't believe God wants his people to be here when he does that, because when he pulled out Noah, then he unleashed what? He unleashed the natural disasters, which was the flood, the great, the deluge. And then he took out Noah and Lot out of the world, and where did he place them? In an ark. He protected them. Uh, that's why Abraham asked God, he said, Lord, if there were uh, 40 people, righteous people on earth, would you destroy the world? And the Lord said, no, not for 40 righteous people. And then he said, how about if there were 30 left? Would you destroy the world? And he said, no, not even for 30. Then he asked about 20, and he went down to 10. He says, if there were 10 righteous people, would you destroy the world? And what did God say? No. In other words, God couldn't even find 10 righteous people at the time of Noah. So he took Noah out, his family, and he protected him in the ark, and that's the way, and then he unleashed his wrath upon the world. That's the way the Lord is going to do it with us too. But whether it be before the tribulation or in the middle, I'm not going to dogmatize and speak with finality, but I, I, I have reason to believe it may be in the middle, before the natural, I say, disasters. Because, because if in the early church, the early Christians shed their blood for Christ, in the arenas, amen, in the Roman Colosseums, are we any better? Uh, we say today that the church will end up being like the early church, purified, cleansed, uh, perfected, uh, more consecrated to, to the divine founder, the Lord Jesus Christ. It will be like the early church in its purity and its power. Okay, but like Jim mentioned earlier, we cannot have power unless we have what? Martyrdom. Unless we're ready to shed our blood for Jesus Christ. So it doesn't surprise me if, if uh, the righteous are around for the first three and a half years. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But the important thing is that uh, whether, uh, if we're still on earth, uh, still we'll be with Jesus in heaven because all the martyrs will be among the elect. 
There is no better way to be saved than to shed your blood for Jesus Christ. <coughs> I mean, that's a 100% guarantee of salvation, believe me. So, uh, we are commanded, therefore, by the Lord to live in holiness and urgently witness as though he will return before, before tomorrow. And we never know when Jesus will come and we will hear the, the shout in the voice of the archangel. But we're called upon to be ready. That's why we need to know these e eternal truths so that we may be encouraged to be prepared and to be alert and to be vigilant so that we might not miss out on the kingdom of heaven. Because there will be so many in the churches today who will be uh, who will fall for the deception of the Antichrist. And I tell you, my beloved, that today the vast majority in our Greek Orthodox churches, forget about other denominations, they got their problems. There'll be plenty of victims of the Antichrist in the other churches too. But let's look at our own home here. A charity begins at home here. And the judgment of God starts with his household. I believe that a vast majority of our Greek Orthodox are potential victims of the Antichrist, that his deception will be accepted uh, by, uh, by the vast majority, because uh, as even Dr. Andreas said, that, uh, that Satan is working through shepherds today in the, in the churches. There will be false shepherds, shepherds uh, uh, appearing as sheep, as wolves, rather, they are wolves in sheep's clothing. And they will be deceiving and misguiding God's elect flock. And that's why um, it's important that we get the message of the renewal out, because the message of renewal is a message of repentance and warning our people that they might not perish in the flames of eternal hell, in the lake of fire, in which uh, the Antichrist and the false prophet will be cast in there forever, to burn forever. And then ultimately, ultimately even Satan will be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. And all those who follow Satan and who have accepted the mark of the beast. And the way we're going, there will be many people who will accept the mark of the beast because they'll be rationalized by our religious leaders. They'll say, well, we've got to be... Uh, law-abiding citizens, and, uh, and it doesn't really matter. Even in Greece, the ID cards were ready to be issued with an X666. Did you know that in Greece? And there was a big outcry. People went out in the streets and they demonstrated against it. And you know, some uh, religious leader was saying, well, you can't get those for you know, and so, you know, we're seeing this attitude already of uh, that's all right. You know, let's have a little law and order around here. Concerning those who have lost the grace of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because of disobedience and rebellion against God. So it's one or the other mark. Take your choice. Make your choice now. Can we challenge our people today with that? Are you ready to go out there and get the message out to the people? And tell them about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes, yeah, that's what they need. They need that, you know what I call that? Good thing no one's listening. I hope the walls aren't bugged. I call it the Eighth Sacrament. See, I'm breaking all the rules. There's only seven. But I, I'm adding an eighth one. You know which one is that? From heaven. The sovereign, supernatural over outpouring of the Holy Spirit. As Joel predicts in his prophecy, in the last days I shall pour out my Holy Spirit upon all flesh, upon Protestants, upon Roman Catholics, upon Orthodox. You might say, yes, but the Protestants need this because they don't have the sacrament of the chrismation. Let them get the Holy Spirit. And the Catholics, they don't have valid uh, chrismation. Let them get this Holy Spirit. But we don't need it. We got the seven sacraments. We're all anointed and so on. Or oh, are we? Read St. Simeon. That's why we need his testimony for the end times. He lived 1,000 years ago, but he sounds like he wrote those writings 
yesterday he wrote them. So my beloved, it's one or the other. I have written a, a, a little booklet on that. Uh, which mark will it be? Take, take some copies and give them out to your Greek Orthodox friends. It's a very, very good, strong um, little message there. Hallelujah. So, we move on now. Let's talk about the Millennial Kingdom. Now, I was never taught that Christ was going to come down to earth and stay here. I was always taught in seminary that Christ is going to come just long enough to separate the sheep from the goats and then leave this uh, terrible world. The, fat, the quicker the better. How many of you have had that feeling always? Uh, I always had that feeling from childhood that the Lord is going to come very fast do a, a quick work get us out of here because it's a wicked world anyhow we've suffered enough in this world who wants to hang around this world that's under Satan amen but uh, my Bible says that Jesus Christ is not going to rush to leave when he comes back after the great tribulation he's returning with his saints but what is he returning to do he's returning to destroy He's going to destroy the Antichrist and the false prophet and the dragon. How is he going to destroy him? By the word of his mouth and by his appearance. He will be decimated, annihilated, and cast into the lake of fire. Very short work of him. The guy named, very short work of, 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 of the Antichrist. And with him will go whom? All those who accepted the mark of the beast, of the Antichrist. So, uh, I'm not getting into too much detail here, but I just want to give you a kind of a general perspective of the picture here. And that at that time, when Jesus comes back, the armies of the nations of the world will be directed against Jerusalem. And what are they going to do? What will they be what will their objective be? To destroy the Jewish nation and to destroy the Jews and to put an end to Israel. Why? Because Satan knows that God has not finished with the Jews. How many of you know that? You know, I always used to think that since the Jews crucified Christ, God wrote them off, Delio said. Uh, end of story. But I got news for you. God hasn't finished with the Jews yet. That's why after 3,000 years, he brought them back to Jerusalem, to the Holy Land. He's getting them ready. Whether they know it or not, whether the Arabs know it or not, whether the UN knows it or not, God has his plan, his timetable. Everyone will be in for a big surprise. But the Antichrist will have his temple built so that he can go in there in the Holy of Holies and appear as the God. He will act as God and demand worship from all of his subjects. Amen? And then, then as I said, the armies will come to destroy uh, Jerusalem, and at that time, uh, probably half of Jerusalem will be taken. Then Jesus comes back and saves uh, the Jews. He saves them uh, from destruction by his inter divine intervention, the timing of the Lord. And then Jesus sets up his kingdom upon earth. In the, in the book of the Revelation, we find very clearly that Jesus will be on earth for 1,000 years after that. And that Satan, listen to this, will be bound and chained and placed in a bottomless pit for 1,000 years. And... Uh, 
It says, the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, and such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with Christ one thousand years. And yet, most theologians today take the thousand years as only a general period of time. They say there's no such thing as the earthly rule of Christ on earth. They don't believe that Christ will stay on earth, that it's unbecoming to Christ to stay on earth, that any earthly kingdom is not scriptural, because Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Uh, how can Jesus rule on earth? Well, of course, his kingdom is not of this world, but it's in this world, ultimately. But the, his kingdom is from above, and will come up. That's why we pray in the Lord's Prayer, let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So is his will on earth as it is in heaven today? Of course not. Because who rules the world today? The, what the Bible calls the prince of this world. Archon tu cosmo tutu. So the kingdoms of this world are still the kingdoms under the lordship of Satan. That's why Satan, when he tempted Christ, what did he offer to him? He says, if you bow down to me, I will give you all these kingdoms. How could he tell them that if they were not his? But they were his to give to anybody. Why? Because Adam forfeited the kingdom of God on earth. <coughs> it was cast out of, 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 of the Garden of, of Eden. So, uh, so the, in the early church, and I don't have time to exhaust this tonight, but in, in the early church, the fathers of the church, they taught the millennium, the thousand-year rule of Christ upon earth. And, uh, you know, it says 1,000 years in, in chapter 20 of Revelation. You know how many times? Almost six times. How many times does, does it have to say it to believe it? And yet, no. And there was one church father who influenced the uh, trend and the theology of, on eschatology, and that was St. Augustine. He was a man of God, great man of God, Ayus, a fine, but, of course, no, even the church fathers were not perfect. But he could not accept that Christ was going to rule on earth for a thousand years. He said that thousand-year rule is already started. Since uh, Jesus rose from the dead, he destroyed the power of the devil. So the devil is chained already. But I'll tell you, you look around and you tell me that Satan is chained. I don't see any signs of his being chained. In fact, if anything, I see that he's uh, living and doing well. He's alive and doing well, uh, Satan. And Jesus said, And iniquity shall multiply, for the love of many shall wax cold. Well, if iniquity will multiply, then how can Satan be chained? Uh, for a thousand years. His time of chain, being chained hasn't come yet. So the, the teaching of Augustine, who was a Neoplatonist anyhow, he was influenced by Platonic philosophy because before he was converted, he was a philosopher. He was uh, an expert in philosophy and literature. And like some other church fathers, they were influenced by Plato, who, who, who believed that what is material is evil. What is matter is evil. The source of all evil is matter. So therefore, the kingdom of God cannot be earthly. It's a contradiction in terms. The kingdom of God is, has to be celestial. So the kingdom of God is not on this earth, but where? In heaven, someplace. In an invisible kingdom. That's what our official theology is today. Do you hear me? So be ready, my beloved, be ready. And uh, we, have, we have many uh, e evidences in the early church fathers. Now when I say early church fathers, I'm talking about the first three centuries. You have uh, a, man, a man like St. Justin Martyr, 
one of the early church fathers who lived in the, I think, the late 100s, early 200s. And he spells it out, and he, he teaches the millennium that Jesus will rule on earth a 1,000 years. And he says, By, but I and others who are right-minded Christians on all points, did you hear that, right-minded, are assured that there will be a resurrection of the dead and a thousand years in Jerusalem, which will then be built, adorned, and enlarged, as the prophets Ezekiel and Isaiah and others declare. And then he says, And further, there was a certain man with us whose name was John, one of the apostles of Christ, who's John the Revelator, who prophesied by a revelation that was made to him that those who believed in our Christ would dwell a thousand years in Jerusalem, and that thereafter the general and in short the eternal resurrection and judgment of all men would likewise take place, just as our Lord also said, and so on. So that's saying just the martyr. Now, if he could say that, why can't I say it? If he's orthodox, then uh, I should be orthodox. And then he says, and therefore, when in the end the church shall be suddenly caught up from this, uh, there shall be tribulation such as has not been since the beginning, neither shall be, etc., etc. So, Saint, uh, then that's Saint Irenaeus. And then Saint Irenaeus also speaks about the millennium. Uh, in very concise uh, language, listen to this. Uh, Inasmuch, therefore, as the opinions of certain orthodox persons are derived from heretical discourses, they are both ignorant of God's dis dispensations and of the mystery of the resurrection of the righteous. Now listen to this. And of the earthly kingdom, which is the beginning of incorruption, by means of which kingdom those who shall be worthy are accustomed gradually to partake of the divine nature. And it is necessary to tell them respecting these things that it behooves the righteous first to receive the promise of the inheritance which God promised to the fathers and to ruin it when they rise again to behold God in this creation which is renovated and that the judgment should take place afterwards. Now listen to this. For it is right, just, that in that very creation in which they toiled or were afflicted and persecuted, being proved in every way by suffering, they should receive the reward of their suffering, and that in the creation in which they were slain. Did you hear that? Where will they be rewarded? In the very place they shed their blood. They're coming back to receive that compensation. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, because of their love for God, in that they should be revived again, and that in the creation in which they... They suffered servitude in that they should reign. Where are they going to rule? In the place where they were humiliated and where they were slaves to the unbelievers. For God is rich in all things, etc., etc. Isn't that beautiful? So, St. Irenaeus, of course, uh, he was from the, the, the school of Asia Minor again, just as St. Justin the Martyr says, Hallelujah. Glory to God. Uh, and then he speaks about the millennium and how the wolves and the lambs shall then browse together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox and the serpent earth as if it were bread, etc., etc. And that, that excites me. That excites me. And Jesus will be in Jerusalem and that will be the seat of government. Many of the nations will go up from year to year to worship the Lord, and they will populate the earth during the millennium. In other words, you know what the millennium is going to be? Please don't walk around uh, in one place. The millennium is going to be a restoration of the Garden of Eden. Did you hear me? When, when God created Adam and Eve, what, what was the purpose of his creating Adam and Eve? That they may live forever in that garden and enjoy what? The ultimate blessings of God. And ultimately, the whole planet Earth was to become the Garden of Eden, was to spread, to be expanded. 
and not only in the Mesopotamian area there where it started. And so when Jesus comes back, he's going to continue where he left off. That, doesn't that stand to reason? He's not going to let the devil get away with what he did back then with Adam and Eve. What did he do to Adam and Eve? He caused them to lose <coughs> the Garden of Eden. Well, that's not the like we say in Greek. But Christ is going to come back and he's going to create a Garden of Eden for the whole world to spite the devil so that his righteous ones may indeed enjoy what God destined them to enjoy from the beginning. Does that make sense? Isn't that the kind of a God that would do such a thing? Doesn't that make sense? That he's going to raise Adam and Eve and they're going to come back to the Garden of Eden but they're not going to be alone anymore but they're going to be with you and me and many other saints of God. Hallelujah. And then after one, the 1,000 years, the Bible tells us, I don't have time to get into all the details, the Bible says that the, that, that the, the devil will be unchained again, will be loosed from uh, the, the, the bottomless pit. Now why would God want to do that? What is it? Why didn't he just get rid of them, get it over with? Well, I don't know. But the Lord loosens the devil and the devil starts playing his old tricks again and he arouses the nations to rebellion again and they threaten again they come toward Jerusalem where the seat of, of Christ's government is to destroy this kingdom Satan won't give up why? what's the ultimate purpose of Satan? to win the universal worship of mankind set up his kingdom uh, so he raises up the power of the devil raise up these nations and they march toward Jerusalem to destroy the kingdom seated in Jerusalem and including whom to destroy Christ again so what happens they don't get very close to Jerusalem and then what does the Lord do well, he finishes them off. That's it. That's the last straw for Christ. And in one day, he destroys uh, with some supernatural uh, sign, natural sign, he destroys the, the enemies, the armies that number in the hundreds of thousands. They'll be all destroyed. The, the blood will flow up to the uh, the, the bridle of the horses, the horse's bridle. There will be so much blood shed. And uh, it says there that for I don't know how many months and years the fowls of the air will be feeding on the corpuses, on the carcasses. Of, they won't be buried. No one will be buried. It's called the great feast of, of the Lord. In other words, he's inviting all of of his animals, his animal world, to come and have a feast on him. It's all on me, the Lord says. Help yourselves. And uh, they won't have to bury them because their, their flesh will be eaten up. So the, the world will be cleansed by uh, these animals, the, the fowls of the air, whatever kind of bird it will be. And... Uh, and it, it, it will be a, a, a beautiful picture of the complete triumph of Christ upon earth. That's the end of the millennium. And then Satan will be cast into the lake of fire. Amen? And that's the end of him. That's, and then, of course, we have the great white throne judgment. I don't have time to get into that tonight, where the wicked will be tried, and they will be cast, the wicked and the unbelievers into the lake of fire. Limni to piros, like we say in Greek. And, but that's not the end. See, it's exciting the stages uh, of, the, of, the, of the age beyond the grave, my beloved, is so exciting that even the millennium doesn't exhaust uh, life beyond the grave. Because the book of the Revelation tells us in chapter 21 that something very extraordinary will happen 
a, a, a new heaven and a new earth will take place. Listen to this. Now, I know you're tired, but don't, you've got to hear this because your eternity is at stake. I'm, if you're tired once, I'm tired ten times. I'm uh, twice your age, age of some of you here sitting down, so don't, don't tell me you're tired. Uh, uh, it says there, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea, which means that at that time, after the uh, millennium, uh, God will do a work of cleansing and he will cause a conflagration to cover the whole planet Earth. In other words, a universal fire which will cleanse the Earth. The imia catharsis, metphotia anaphylaxis, we say in Greek, yeniki anaphylaxis. And somehow he's going to protect the righteous. They will not be affected by this universal conflagration. How he's going to do it, don't ask me. I don't have all the answers. But the Lord, if he knew how to protect Noah and Lot, he'll know how to protect the righteous. Amen? The, the, so the world will not be destroyed by water anymore, but it's going to be destroyed by what? By fire. And somehow the righteous will be spared, but there will be a universal saint. Peter brings it up. I don't have time to get into 2 Peter there, where he speaks about the dissolution of the elements. I mean, a frightful uh, thought. Frightful thought. Uh, you might say, well, why doesn't the Lord just get rid of planet Earth and move us to another planet? There's so many planets out there, you know? Count them. Did you ever count the planets? I mean, what is he fooling around with this earth and cleaning it up? And why doesn't he just get rid of it? And I mean, the way you and I would do it. Hey, Nancy, we get tired of something, we say, I'm going to buy a new one, throw it in the trash can, get over with. Well, that's not the way God works. God never destroys what he creates, but he does what? He renovates it. He overhauls it. That's his love. He shows his wisdom. He doesn't do everything he wants to do. He wanted to destroy Israel in the Old Testament. He got sick and tired of them once. Remember, he says, I've had it with you. I'm going to just get rid of you. And Moses says, oh, Lord, don't do that. Because what are the nations going to say? What kind of a God is this? I mean, can't he even handle his own people? I mean, does he have to destroy them? So uh, God is not going to destroy the world because of Satan. Because that would be to his satisfaction, to the devil's satisfaction. What does the devil want? He wants... Mankind destroyed the planet that God created, destroyed. Better to perish, no. God's not going to do him that favor. So he's going to do a cleansing, oh, a radical cleansing. I don't understand everything about it, but after that, the world is cleansed. There won't be any pollution anymore, no environmental problems. We won't need any government environmental agencies to monitor the pollution of the lakes and of the oceans and the rivers anymore. Everything will be crystal clear, clean. And it says there, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, behold, I make all things new, it says there. And it says, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Listen to this. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. Well, wait a minute. I thought Jerusalem on earth, on earth was new. Didn't we say that he, Jesus reigned there for 1,000 years? I mean, what do we need another Jerusalem? I mean, I thought that was sanctified. I mean, Jesus was there. No. Nothing's perfect enough for God. But this Jerusalem is going to come down from heaven. How many of you know that heaven is going to come down to earth? My goodness, this shatters all my old uh, beliefs. And, and my idea about heaven, that heaven is up. And hell is down. But it's the other way around. We're going to come down. Heaven's going to come down to us. This might sound radical. It's going to spoil all your, your theology. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, because if any of you not prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Do you know that from the foundation of the world, God has been preparing this new Jerusalem? 
that the ultimate purpose of God's creation of the universe is this, this heavenly Jerusalem. That ultimately he planned even for Adam and Eve, ultimately. But because of sin, God had to put it off. But now that Jesus paid the price of Adam's curse, now that New Jerusalem is ready to come down. What did Jesus say to his apostles? I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house, there are many what? Mansions. There are many mansions. And I go to prepare a place for you. You know what he was referring to? He was referring to the New Jerusalem. And I don't have time tonight, but in chapter 21, it goes over all the measurements. Did you hear me? How many miles wide? Hi, I don't have time to get into that. The new Jerusalem will be. Do you believe that this new Jerusalem is going to be physical? Now, wait a minute. I thought heaven was spiritual. I thought it was celestial. I mean, isn't that crass? Isn't that too vulgar? I mean, God bringing down a material world to us? I mean, I thought... The kingdom of God was spiritual. I thought we were going to be floating in the clouds with harps and, and uh, flying around with the angels. And now we're going to be walking around in the city of Jerusalem. And what is this? What kind of a heaven is that going to be? I kind of think it will be a nice heaven. I don't want to leave this world. I think it's beautiful, after, especially after the, the Lord takes care of finishes with it. And he says, I make all things new. And uh, he that overcometh shall inherit all things that will be his God, and he shall be my son. Do you know, my beloved, God has prepared a physical Jerusalem in heaven? He's going to live in that Jerusalem, and there's going to be a temple he's going to build. The temple of the Antichrist will be burned, but Jesus is going to build a new temple and this time it will never end. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Praise God. And it says there, uh, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defiles, neither whatsoever works abomination or makes a lie, but they who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Oh, that, that's exciting. And it says there, uh, it says there, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he who is filthy, let him be filthy still, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. Behold, I come quickly, and and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work. Amen. Isn't that exciting? What God has prepared for us. Do you realize what's waiting for us? You know what we're lacking in the Greek Orthodox Church? A sense of expectation. Our, we're a church filled with boredom. Bored people. Religiously, religiously bored who find religion so boring and dull that they have nothing exciting. They have to bring some kind of a political speaker to come to excite, excite things in the church, you know. It's going to be emotional, community, looking for some kind of a sideshow to spice things up a little bit. Because there's no, our, our, our people don't expect anything. It's just, uh, oh, um, just another liturgy. Well, until next Sunday, and like someone said, uh, our people don't enjoy the liturgy, they endure it. And can't wait until it's finished so they can go home and build up a little, little courage for the next Sunday to go and uh, endure the next service. So, my beloved, I just thank Jesus. I'm closing now with these final thoughts. Uh, I told you that I'm not going to exhaust this, and uh, I went through it kind of rapidly. In fact, I forgot to quote also from this other Latin father, Lactandius, of the third century, who also teaches uh, Jim the millennial doctrine and spells it out. 
he lived uh, for a while in Asia Minor and probably was uh, received the teaching, the Johannine teaching from the school of, 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 uh, of uh, St. John. Do you have a question? Orthodox, isn't it? It's also nothing uh, Protestant about it or uh, fundamentalist about it. So, my beloved, are you ready uh, with me to meet the Lord in the air? Are you ready for the kingdom, the 1,000-year kingdom, which, which will follow uh, another New Jerusalem? And how long are we going to live in the New Jerusalem? How many of you know? How long are we going to live in the New Jerusalem? 1,000 years? Forever. Forever. There will be no end to our existence. Uh, let's all stand up now and uh, show and confess to the Lord our conviction, our commitment to, the, to this reality, to this mystery.